materials here. Um, are you ready? You're going? Okay, good. Uh, so, as you know, we have a school starters course, an online course every year. Uh, and we've helped people start about 100 schools that we know of. Every once in a while, I'll come into, run into somebody who says, oh, you helped us start our school. Said, we, really? Yeah, yeah, we got all your materials from the website. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good, you know. So, you know, and, and as far as the school starters course, you know, you can take it for credit, but most people don't because what they want is to start their school. That's the bottom line. <clears throat> and so, and our job is really, we don't really care too much. We'd like to have a lot of participation and so on, but the funny thing is there are a lot of people who barely participate, but then they still start their school. And some people who look like they got nothing out of it, and then four years later, they say, oh, we started our school. So it's different people have different processes by which they do this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around to each person, and I am going to ask you uh, what sh where you want to start your alternative and what kind of thing it's going to be. Then we'll take s as many specific examples as we can and actually start going through and talk about what we can, and people can chime in on stuff too. We have another microphone, but it was out of battery. I wonder if I can get it, but whatever. Uh, so then I don't have to do this all the time. But I, I think I can. No, it's not here. It's out there. It, it had no battery. I brought it to the desk out there. But eh, you know, we're OK for now. All right, so I'm going to start. I'm just going to go around this way. And, f and if you can, uh, let's see if I can. I'm going to try to take notes and hold the microphone and chew, gu chew gum and whatever. Uh, so uh, your name is? Hi, I'm Laura Pretty. And, and do you want me to talk about our? Yeah. I wonder, I'm. No, I only want you to say briefly where it's going to be and what it's going to be. Oh, OK. So we, I'm in Denver Public Schools. And I'm here with Allison, who will tell you more about it. Oh, OK. Um, she said I'm Allison, so I am. Um, and we're doing a. Um, democratic Republic uh, independent learning democratic school in Denver Public Schools. So, so um, okay. Allison's part of a group that is trying to um, complete an application to open up a charter. And my job is essentially to facilitate and support the students in doing that. Okay. My name is Jimena. Um, How do you spell it? X I M E N A. Okay. Jimena. I am in Guatemala, and uh, we're starting a teacher training school program in Funsepa, the organization and an organization. And I want to start a Montessori um, school. I'm Kathy Ray Highland, and we took an inner city child care in Tacoma. Kathy? Here, I'll give you my card. And here, thank you. And we are partway through the process, but. I need more input, especially on the issues of finances. Where is it going to be? It's in Tacoma, Washington. Here, Tacoma. I'll give you my card. No, no, I'm not going okay. And what's it going to be? What it's a Montessori. Okay. Yeah, so I'll just take this. Yeah, okay. Just, well, hold on. Montessori. What ages? For what ages? We start at 12 months. 12? Wow. And wow. we are an approved private school through eighth grade. But we, of course, want to expand into high school. OK. Go ahead. I am Erin. And I am I started a school before. But now I'm looking to do um, a distributed learning in Canada, so independent, British Columbia, and small, local, because these provincial ones aren't working what, for what, us. What kind of school? Independent, distributed learning. What with? Private? Independent, so private. Yeah, yeah we okay. don't call it private. Yeah. But um, 
the aspect is focused on the middle schoolers because there's so much for primary, there's so much for high school, and these kids that go into grade four and up, they're just lost. And some kind of like um, social learning community each week, just once a week. So okay. I just finished my master's in this distributed learning, so hopefully that helps. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christine, and I'm from Los Angeles. And I've just recently returned to a school I founded or co-founded uh, more than 30 years ago in Los Angeles, a preschool. Um, I just recently returned what, to it. What's the school? The school's called All Children Great and Small. And it's a preschool. We serve um, children and families from the children are three to six or seven years old. Um, but uh, we, I want to expand it. Uh, that the board wants to expand it uh, to at least to get to eight years old, eight-year-old people. But uh, uh, anyway, it's a whole process, and we're still working on our core values. I'm working with some other people as well. So I sort of would like to make a birth-to-death school, you know, all ages. But it's really you, a challenge. Have, have you been Arrow members, right? Yes. I've seen it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, go ahead. Uh, I'm Gail Draper, and I helped found a school 30 years ago that's K through 6 in Hollywood. Same thing or different No, schools? but oh, we okay. worked what? together there, and I am her partner in crime now in trying to, it's time to start something new again. So you started a school in L.A.? Yeah. The same one or? No. Different one? Yeah. Okay, wow. <laughs> but we're friends. <laughs> okay. I started you're going, and you're going to I'm help her partner her, in crime. You're going to help her do the thing. Yes. Okay. That is the hope. Wow. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Claire Bean, and I live in Westland, Oregon, just a suburb of uh, Portland. I'd like to start um, an alternative school, maybe, um, for probably K through 6. Uh, private? I don't know yet. Probably. K to six. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Griffin Toffler, and I live in Sacramento. Um, I would, I have, I'm brimming with ideas about an educational system, <laughs> and I haven't really shared it a whole lot with other people, but I, I'm just looking for. Uh, ways to express these ideas and connect with other people. Um, and I'd like to have a community-based school, K through six, family-based, community-based, and in the public school system. Pub in the public school system? Yes, uh, but um, I don't, don't know if that would be charter or, you know, but I, I want to reach the community population and not have it be an exclusive group. Okay. Hi, I'm West from Rainbow Community School in Asheville. What, what's your name? West. West, okay. Um, oh. Rainbow is adding an arm to their organization that will be teacher training focused. Where and is it? It's in Asheville, North Carolina. And then we only go through eighth grade, so we would like to also expand our model through high school. In addition, I would like to start a school in Tennessee. Oh. So I'm in transition mentally and physically and emotionally, so it may mean that I make a move. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. Um, I'm Marie Palmer, and I've taken the school starters course and uh, actually only barely participated, a little more than barely participated, and... You, ha you have a school going now? And um, at the level that I want it to be, so what where, we're... Where, where are you? In Corvallis, Oregon. Corvallis, okay. Mm -hmm. So um, we're working on, my husband and I are working on building a, uh, basically like an, uh, it's called an agrarian urbanist community development, and I see the community as our school, and then it'll have school resources within it as well. What age would it be for? Um, all human beings, but there, well, I have the neighborhood school which exists within it, and 
um, that's basically my kids' homeschool and whoever we connect with, and you know we're working within that. So it's a compli. It's kind of a there's the smaller current thing, and then uh, the bigger process that we're building. Okay. Hi, I'm Esty Auerbach, and uh, I I'm currently a school director in Mercer Island. Um, it's an early childhood center with 230 kiddos, one of the biggest one in Washington State. And the request from parents are, is to continue that program. It's a Raise Your Inspired School. And I am dying to open uh, an elementary school that is Regio. I know that they they have one in Italy and one in Israel that I helped open. What kind? Regio Emilia. So it's Malaguzzi's work. Um, and Jerry, I know that you're going to help me open it. So I'm looking forward. It's not that a request. And, one, and you're involved with one in Mercer Island now. Yes, but it's a preschool. So I'm oh. hoping to either offer kindergarten first grade and start that the same way place or yes something else. or something else k through okay and jerry you're going to help me right <laughs> of course of course <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah my name is sherry ranky and i'm sherry? from sherry c h e r i yeah and from dallas oregon and we just opened up a new charter school this last year dallas community school now we're trying to figure out to learn from all of our mistakes of what we did wrong and and uh, moving back towards the arrow the learner model versus the traditional mindset which we kind of all struggle with um, hi I'm Bex I'm from Australia um, from where Australia, Australia. yeah uh, we um, are looking to start a, a resource center um, slash sort of maker um, center for f initially available to homeschool families and then from where that goes. I'm Re a resource center for homeschoolers? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> okay. And um, which pro in which state? Uh, New South Wales. What, New, New South Wales. New South Wales. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So, <laughs> and did you, we, did you go yet? You didn't go yet. Go ahead. Oh, here. Okay, yeah. I'm Bethany. I'm from Boise, what, Idaho. What Beth Bethany. Yeah. I'm from Boise, Idaho, and I want to start a Sudbury inspired school. Oh, uh, what? I Sudbury inspired. Sudbury inspired. <laughs> okay. Uh, in in Boise. Yes. For all ages. All ages. Okay. Okay, and you guys are part of the same program. Okay. So. So. <laughs> all right. Um, who would like to uh, start first? I will, I'll talk about your program. Anybody want to start first? What? What are we going to say? Uh, what, just what your vision is and all that. You want to start? Sure. Okay, here. Um, in my area, we have several private schools, but they're all very um, academically rigorous, and most of them are religious-based, and I would like to offer something that's age-integrated. I think that's a really important piece, and something that's not um, based on any specific religion, so that people can actually have freedom um, and we have a lot of homeschoolers but not something that kind of gives kids more community and more opportunities to explore different things so that's kind of okay. my so um, let's see um, and this is going to be where Boise Idaho In Boise do you think in Boise you have a market for that kind of school? Yes. I ha currently have a Facebook group with between 50 and 80 members. So okay. I'm planning um, an informational meeting to meet the families actually this coming week. How about the laws in Idaho? Uh, do the, how, is, how, how 
easy or hard do you think it would be to start a school like that in Idaho? I think it would be relatively easy. Um, I haven't decided if I want to organize it as more of a co-op or actually a school. There are a few restrictions on actual schools that might be a little bit tricky, but Idaho is fairly unregulated educationally. So the legislators are fairly unregulated. When yeah. you say co-op, what do you mean? I mean that it would be more of like a program that people would be members of rather than officially a school. Okay, so you don't really mean a parents cooperative. What you mean is a homeschool resource center or something like that. That's probably. This is a very important thing, and I'll tell you why. In my experience, when people try to start parent co-ops, inevitably it breaks down into squabbling. Uh, and it becomes all about the parents. And I tell people in our school starters course that you have to have the vision. Somebody has to be the vision holder and make sure it goes in that direction. And someone, you have to step up and do that. You can have all kinds of people help you. You'll need lots of help. But it has to be your school. Even if you've got a nonprofit, you must have a director that has the power to run the school. And then if that doesn't work, then, they, then the board can get another director. But that, that, that it has to be, that has to be the vision keeper. So I think that's why I wanted to clarify that. Yes, and that's actually something I thought about. And someone else had talked to me about that, the kind of the squabbling thing. And I definitely want to avoid that because I don't want to yeah, start something that's going to. I have a group um, on Long Island that met for the year. First, they say, wanted me to start a school. You know, suburbs. You start a school, we'll decide whether we buy it. No, it's not going to happen. <laughs> you are going to have to start something. And it may have to be a homeschool resource center because, you know, schools in a lot of places are difficult. Uh, to start uh, and over a period of time they they came to realize that yes uh, that maybe they could do this but then the person who kind of was really kind of pushing that and who actually found a location two floors of a building for two hundred dollars a month wow. <laughs> wasn't really ready to, to take over as the director, so she set it up as a parents' cooperative, which broke down two years later in squabbling, and that was the end of it. And somebody else muscled in and kind of took over, and that person has continued doing that kind of thing. You want to comment on that? Well, yeah. Just had a question, Ken. Hold on. Yeah. I just had a question. If, can you be the vision holder and have someone else be the director? Not really. Uh, I don't think so. Um, however, you can hire administrators to do certain things. Yeah. So we're a public um, charter school, and it's our biggest problem right now is exactly what you're saying because our board has one vision. They hired teachers that are traditional teachers who have the desire to be involved in this model, but they have not shared that vision as well as, as they should have or could have. And so, and you have a director who's in a totally different direction. So that's our biggest struggle right now. And so now we're trying to reorganize and trying to set that vision. This has to be resolved. Uh, and it has to be resolved with the board letting go and with the director saying, look, I'm the director or not. I'll leave or I'm the director, but you have to let me direct. It has to be that way. Okay. Um, so now you said Sudbury inspired. And what does that exactly mean? <laughs> well, that's a complicated question. <laughs> Um, I really like the aspects, actually I like everything about Sudbury. 
Um, I think maybe I would describe it as a progressive Sudbury model because I want there to be more parental involvement and I want to um, incorporate some things kind of like what Ba does at SUMA where they do parent training and helping parents understand kind of a Sudbury lifestyle outside of school. So I think that's where I want to like add that to what I want to do. Uh, okay, so uh, you can hold on for this <laughs> minute. Uh, I don't need both of them really. Um, Double fisted. Um, and, but when you say Sudbury inspired, are you implying that you don't necessarily want to be a Sudbury school? Yes, because I don't know if I actually want to be a school in the legal sense. Okay. Um, I think it's important. Some people uh, don't quite get some of the gradations of different types of democratic schools. And they think Sudbury means the same thing as democratic school. Sudbury is a kind of democratic school. There are other kinds of democratic schools that have different philosophies. They're all learner-centered, but they have different ideas about the ways to do it. Sudbury never wants a teacher to offer a class. Uh, on the other hand, some of the schools that we help people to start, like Brooklyn Free School, Agile Learning Center, and so on, teachers are free to offer classes. Students don't have to go. Um, and so that's one difference. Uh, there's the other thing, uh, basically Sudbury schools n must have judicial committees to make, uh, to kind of resolve legal infractions and things like that, whereas some other schools, like some of the ones that we help people start, are happy to just have this go through the meeting and then if there's a need for something more, they will establish what's called a, a small group. So those are a couple of things to be aware of. Uh, and then also it's true that some of these schools don't necessarily vote on the teachers every year. Um, Summerhill doesn't seem to think, for example, that kids even care about that, you know, uh, and other things like that. And so, uh, so it varies a lot. There is kind of a, a spectrum of approaches within democratic schools where Sudbury's at one end where staff are not supposed to offer classes. And Peter, I think, did a nice job of explaining that and why and so on last night. Uh, Summerhill's kind of at the other end, where they have a timetable. And the kids just don't have to go to it. But it's there. Uh, and in the middle are some of the schools, like the ones that we help people start, where the staff can offer any class they want. It doesn't have to be our students. And it doesn't have to be in a particular area. And uh, again, kids don't have to go. So that's just, so, uh, so uh, to what extent, where are you uh, with the organizational aspect of this so far? Uh, so far, I'm gathering interest from the community and finding other people who are interested in being a part of it. Okay. And um, have you had meetings? I have met with two people, um, just one-on-one, -on -one, and I have a meeting scheduled for um, this week, later this week, actually. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about like how much you want to charge? Yes and no. So you can charge, if you have a homeschool resource center, you can still charge. Right. Uh, would you become uh, for-profit or a, uh, a non-profit, or have you thought about that? I've thought about that, and I'm still trying to determine what would be the best idea. Um, I am an entrepreneur, and I'm involved in a lot of entrepreneurial things in our community, and I think partnering with other um, small businesses and stuff would be something that I would want to do. Uh, there are various uh, advantages and disadvantages of the different things. Uh, Summerhill is actually uh, owned by the Neal family. And Zoe believes that they would have folded to pressure decades ago if they were not, and if they had a board. On the other hand, there are a lot of alternative schools that have boards and are nonprofits, and of course you can take donations one thing to know about that is there's a way of doing that so that um, 
you can sometimes establish or the parents can establish a separate nonprofit from the school that's for scholarships. So that's another way you can do a combination of a for-profit and non-profit. There are a few examples of that in some places. Summerhill now has what they call a bursary fund, which is for scholarships, even though it's still owned by the Neal family. Okay, so very good. Who wants to go next? Hi. So I have a little bit of um, um, background in opening schools because I worked in the Democratic Institute in Israel for the past three years, and that's what the we've- The Democratic Institute of? In Tel Aviv, in Tel Israel. Tel Aviv, and what is that? Okay. So it was, uh, star it started, it was opened by Yaakov Hecht, who started um, the first democratic school in Israel, in Hadera, where my kids went to. And they were very lucky. It's an amazing school. Um, and he had opened it as a consulting firm to help other, just like Jerry's doing, um, other schools, and correct me because you know the, the organization, um, really spread the we wealth. And I think that after, I think that we celebrated our 10th year this year where the Department of Education had taken, w we were able to- Who, uh, Who's 10th year? The, d the, the organization, the Democratic uh, the Institute, initiative. yeah, the is it the 10th year? Because the, the Democratic School is the 25th year that they're okay. celebrating this year. <coughs> um, but one of the beautiful things that we So it's a teacher training program. It's a teacher's training program, but it has many other programs. That we, we help open schools um, in the public arena, not yeah. just in the private sector. Right. We were able to... Um, um, have one of our people who took over after Yaakov, Eyal Ram, to become one of the Department of Education in Israel. He was like the assistant to the, the Minister of Education. And um, so now all the democratic schools in Israel are actually part of the public schooling, you know? And the way so we did so it. So this is interesting. Israel mm -hmm. is almost unique in this respect in that most, if not all, mm -hmm. of the democratic schools are public schools. Right. Without regulation. Wait, that can be democratic. Oh, yep, it's yeah. without regulation. And yeah. the, the ticket that we were going with in the <coughs> in uh, with our, the, with the minister was that we have religious schools that are part of the public education. So why not offer alternative schools as a you know a form of education that other parties want to you know be part of? So, anyways, so I I'm aware of how to open a school in that respect. And I want to open a school at the JCC where I work. However, when I proposed it to the Board of Educators, they said w part of our mission is that we are not going to compete with other Jewish schools in the Puget Sound um, that are actually not doing so well. Uh -huh. But I know that- But I don't think in the United States it's easy to do a religious public school. Right. It can be done, however, because mm -hmm. like Waldorf is kind of a religious R thing. Yeah. They mm -hmm. have to have all the religious aspects of it out. out. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's separated. Mm -hmm. But my question is, I know that I have the, the customers. I know that all the families that graduated, we had 60 kiddos that graduated from pre-K moving to kindergarten and we couldn't offer it to them. And they were furious about it. Mm. And when I went to the board, they said, this is part of our mission, ST, you're not going to create any competition with other schools that represent the Jewish so, so, So your school, is it a Jewish school? It's at the JCC. Yeah. But, and so it's a Jewish school, but we don't practice any. Well, and you have probably some right. non-Jewish kids in it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 60% of our. 60%. Yeah. And okay. actually, we, it's first come, first serve, and we have a huge wait list. And now the board is putting a pressure on me to kind of that lottery system uh. to bump up those Jewish families. And, uh -huh. it, and they know that I won't do it. Yeah. When they recruited me, they knew that I'm not going to do it. So, but that's not the, the issue. The issue is how do, you help, how do I start first convince the board and start introducing K and then first grade and second grade, we know we can do it. It's not, you know, we have the, the faculty, we have the system, yeah. we have the organization behind us, we have the, the revenue. Uh, it's a very expensive preschool. Um, 
would you consider doing it as an independent school? So, um, so probably that will be my only choice if they refuse to accept my, right. my So now my in offer. some places, uh, most places, where it's really not possible to have this kind of school as a public school, one of the ways that we deal with this problem is having a sliding scale tuition. Mm -hmm. So that those people who can afford the upper level, yeah. like uh, Brooklyn Free School, I think goes up to $22,000. Mm -hmm. In Brooklyn, people have that kind of money. Yep. Uh, Island too. And <laughs> on the other end, there are people who come for practically nothing. Mm -hmm. And so it then is not an elitist school. It has a variety of people from different income and racial backgrounds and that sort of thing. So it's uh, a way to go. Mm -hmm. One of the ways to go, okay. to kind of get around that idea of becoming an elitist yeah. school. Now, in your course, Jerry, do you offer the whole um, the whole concept of helping find a building, helping find the the like even the um, the bylaws, you know? Well, the or answer is yeah, yeah. We 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 help mm -hmm. um, with all these things, but. A lot of it is just telling you, okay, now you need to do this. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so that, you know, we can obviously don't know the state laws or government laws everywhere. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, you have to research that and report back mm -hmm. okay. uh, to the people in the course mm -hmm. of what you found. You know, what are the homeschool laws? They're different in every single state. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what are the private school laws? Mm -hmm. What's possible in a public school? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the requirements for charter schools? Do you have to have the core curriculum, curricu curriculum, mm -hmm. stuff like that? But yeah. there may be people from your state there who have background and know all about it. Yeah. yeah. There's so, so much. Oh, sure. The other students. So. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so your main question is, uh, how to move forward with this. Have you had any meetings yet? So I had with the board of directors and with the CEO of the JCC, <coughs> and they very clearly said, Esti, it's a huge dream. It's a beautiful dream. It will cater our families. So you have to understand this is a 65-year-old school, so many of the parents of our children have gone to that preschool. Mm. So it's a huge community, and it's very... So it will be very supportive of this initiative. Right. However, I don't know how to convince them that it has nothing to do with the other Jewish schools because we really, it's going to be a Reggio Emilia inspired philosophy, which we don't have in the state of Washington. Uh, okay, so the, so the school that you have now doesn't use Reggio Emilia. It, it is, but it's it only does. a preschool. Oh, but it does use that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're and the first one in the country. And maybe you can tell people a little bit about what that is. Oh, okay. So Reggio... He is uh, just like this, uh, one of those amazing uh, educators, just like Jerry and, and Gary yesterday, and, Ru and everyone goes back to Rousseau probably, uh, who after World War II uh, helped some mothers who he have met on the street uh, trying to build a, a school. And street of what? Uh, uh, streets in Italy. And actually, he didn't, the, the name Reggio Emilia is from the, the regent, of it in Italy, and um, they're very um, pop, um, known ov all over the world for early childhood education, and actually Israel, um, with the Department of the Democratic, uh, Democratic Education uh, Department in Tel Aviv, uh, we have taken the whole city of Ramat Gan, we sent people to Reggio, and the beauty of the philosophy is really take what really works for your culture, so you cannot duplicated in any ways it's not like a summer hill or a democratic school or it's child led education the teachers have to be highly highly qualified to create those amazing provocations that would create critical thinking and allow children to explore other ideas has a lot of tinkering into the, the pedagogy it's really a wonderful philosophy, I think. Well, it's interesting. It I, I didn't know that Ramat Khan <coughs> was mm -hmm. Reggio, the whole thing. Uh, the the thing either. about Ramat Khan, this is interesting, Yaakov Hecht tells a story mm -hmm. about how he was looking for a crazy mayor uh -huh. that would be willing to let him try to do something for his whole city. 
Mm -hmm. And then this mayor, Ramat Gan, said, yeah, you know, do it mm -hmm. for us. Yep. And so now Yaakov, who started the Democratic School of Hadera to kind of get this whole thing going, now works with entire cities. And this was yep. kind of almost a slum city when, yep. he, when he started out, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's on the Mediterranean, as yep. I understand. Yeah. Actually, what you're referring to is Natanya. Because no, no, I think it was. Well, it's Ramadan. Okay. Well, yeah, I don't we know. Work, but anyway. Actually, Yaakov works. He, the, his concept is to take over s the cities and create those democratic cities. And the beauty of Yaakov's work is really to take failing schools and then you really offer everyone this amazing alternative opportunity. Oh, so he didn't, that's not one of his uh, democratic no, cities. No, the Ramadan, it was I'm right after he of left. I'm thinking of a different city, I think, yeah. Okay. Ah, Batyam. Batyam. Batyam, yes, that's yes, that's his baby. Yes. Right. So, so, yeah, there's so many options. It doesn't have to be just for the elite. You know, in Israel, we really were able, you know, to talk to people. We did circles of connections, and we said, what do you want, parents? And then we went to those officials, and we said, that's what they want. And with the ratio um, in Ramat Gan was really parents that were fed up with the early childhood schooling because it's public in Israel. It's not like he in America. Preschools are public. And um, so I don't want to take all my time, uh, all the time, all of our time, but please go Google Reggio Emilia. It's phenomenal. And it's, it's very, it resonates with the democratic philosophy. And another point about this is that, as you heard, there is a program for teacher training in yep. Israel. And mm -hmm. that really yep. hardly exists anyplace else, and we'd like to see more of those. Yes. Okay, who wants to go next? I just have a comment. Yeah, <laughs> sure. There's actually an application package online for you to open a school in Washington. You only need 12 students and a certified teacher. <laughs> really? Yep, and then they'll do the, the, I just finished my master's trying to figure out how I'm gonna open a school, and I studied Oregon and Washington, and it's on the K-12 website. And to offer kindergarten, you have to, have 12 students and one certified teacher on your application and on the application ask for their certification number and then you just have to follow the laws of that they're not teaching more time and that they have their 180 days it's all in the application and you have to do the application by march for the following september wow that's the easiest state whoa yeah. there you go see it, isn't networking great okay uh who would like to Go next. So I would like to open a true Montessori school in Guatemala. A true Montessori yeah, school? Yeah, because there's I one like uh, private Montessori. It's called Montessori, but it really, it's not. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not. Um, I have my training in assistance to infancy. I'm finishing the first summer right now, and I have the elementary training. But in Guatemala, homeschooling is um, illegal. Mm -hmm. And working, though a lot of people are doing it. And to be able to open a Montessori school that just not doesn't cater to a specific group, um, I would have to ally with the Minister of Education. Yeah. And that would take a lot of the real Montessori essence <laughs> right. from the program. So, Well, you know, uh, as I said to you before, you should no, no, definitely no. visit the Naleb School, which is a pretty radical school mm -hmm. uh, in a lot of ways, kind of based on the idea of the separation of powers. It has an executive, uh, which is the teachers. It has uh, legislative, which is the students, and a judicial. Yeah. Uh, all part of the school in uh, Guatemala, which I visited, and it's a great little school. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that's important to understand about Montessori, which I said to you before, uh, is that there is nothing antithetical about democratic education and Montessori. That she was very radical herself. She said, follow the child, and she meant it. A lot of Montessoris don't do that. But she really meant it. Uh, she even said that uh, any kids over four should be able to vote. Yeah, she wanted to start a party. <laughs> the, the huh? A party for children. Like a yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, so, um, so that's a thing to keep in mind, and there's just no reason why that can't be done. Yeah, and the other project uh, is a teacher training 
teacher program. Teacher training. Yeah. Uh, for public school for teachers. Public school teachers. Yeah. And right now, I'm Would working. Would you try to do this as a public program? Yes. I, I work with an organization, and what they do is they bring technology into the schools, and yeah. they teach. But you, your school would be a public school or a private? You don't know. I, I want it to be private, but cater to... Well, you could have a sliding scale, scale tuition. You can get donations and yes. fundraising. Yes, that's, that's where I'm gearing things towards. Like that. there, that's a whole other thing is how to raise money. Yeah. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> no, no, I mean, we, we, when, we, when we started, uh, when we started with, um, uh, you know, Brooklyn Free School, we, we didn't have, we just, during the whole first year of having meetings, we just had periodic fundraisers. But there was no seed money to begin with, you know. Yeah, but go, go ahead. And I lost my... Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, you were t trying yeah. to figure out whether it would be public or, public or private. And yeah, it probably would start as a private and then to see how it duplicates uh, in different parts. Yeah. Uh, my cousin right now is starting a school which is more based on, on recycling principles and everything, but to bring like mm -hmm. the Montessori seed into those other right. schools that are building right. for public schools. Uh, there's a so. woman that I need to put you in touch with. Um, her name is Sharon Caldwell. I've heard of her. Yeah. And she is, she originally was wanting to start a Montessori school in South Africa for her kids. And then we got to communicating, and she got to visit some independent alternatives, democratic schools. She went to Australia and saw some and so on. And we helped her get her school started in South Africa, which she then ran as a democratic Montessori. So she is our expert on democratic Montessoris, and she's now operating and working with the Montessori Foundation. Sharon? Caldwell, C-A-L-D. W E L L. She's now working with the Montessori Foundation, and so she's happy to help people who want to do this kind of thing. And has had, she did this for ten years or so, you know. Um, and now she's working as a consultant and so on. So that's something to be. Now, wh to what extent have you organized this yet? Uh, so, so you haven't had any meetings yet. No, no. Um, my first approach right now it's. With this organization, which has bring me a lot into the public mm -hmm. part of education, uh, and my first step was getting the training, the knowledge. Uh, and do you know wh where in the country you might want to have it? Right now, city to start with in Guatemala City, and in my cousin's project, it's in Tecpan, which uh -huh. is on the outside. So you're not outside. sure it could be anywhere. Both, because oh, it places. would be like both. Both types of models. One, it would be more oriented mm -hmm. to like mm -hmm. the private, mm -hmm. and then from that part, get the the uh, how you call it, the sliding uh, tuition, sliding scale tuition, and from the other part, it's just implementing the Montessori method in mm -hmm. a public school. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's been built. Good. <laughs> okay. Who is next? Who wants to go next? You got to get to sleep earlier. You know, really. <laughs> I know it's hard because it goes on and on, right? Yeah, I know. Uh, they want to speak, but they're waiting for the other girl went to the bathroom. Oh, so uh, okay. So, okay, when she comes yeah. back, okay. Can you share uh, a little bit about Denver Public Schools? Because you have this wonderful democratic school in Denver. All right, so okay, do, you do, you want, do you want to start anyway? Yeah, start. sure. Okay. okay. Um, so just in terms of Denver, you're thinking of Jefferson County Open School, which is a wonderful school. It's not part of Denver Public Schools. It's part of Jefferson County Public Schools. So it's a different, um, it's a different body, a different district. Um, but in Denver Public Schools, we have my job in the district is I work in our innovation lab which is called the Imaginarium. And it's a lab, um, it's new, we've just been around for a couple of years. And um, it's part of the district, and our job is really to spur innovation across the district. Um, which is fun and interesting and also challenging because we 
when you're trying to spur innovation, there's a lot of different opinions about what that means and where we're headed and that sort of thing. But the best part of my job is, is actually this group here. Um, these guys are trying to create a new school. So their, their goal is to complete the call for quality schools application, which is a, a, the way that you apply to create a new charter in the district. And it's a long, slow process because they're doing a lot of learning. They've been visiting different schools. They've come to Arrow. Um, yeah, this is their second time at Arrow, and they've, they've been working through all the details. Last, last year when they came, they really presented, and they had spent the first year really thinking, learning about different models and sort of building out their governance model. This year, they've been thinking a lot about instruction and what the instructional model is like. Today, they were actually, this morning, they presented um, just a prototype, and I think I think you guys may have learned a lot from it. They, they tried out their judicial co committee process and, and got feedback on it. Um, and so that's where they are right now, working through it. I don't know, Allison, do you want to describe some details about it? About our presentation? About your school. Oh, I guess. Um, oh, well, that was loud. Um, so some things about our school is that um, there are different committees. There's the executive committee, the judicial committee, um, congressional committee, and then the some subcommittees, and then the community relations committee. And all of these have elected officials, both students and staff, onto them to make decisions. Um, so it's not a direct democracy. Um, and then there are different tracks for a student to take in their learning. Um, so say, this is the example I always use pretty much. Um, say I wanted to take like a project-based math class, a independent, because we can't, we can't truly be self-directed because we still have to follow the standards. Um, but so the independent for English and traditional for science. So you could pick whichever one you want to do. And then there's time, there's like blocks of time that are basically like Sudbury blocks where they get to do whatever they want to do. Um, and then there's like, uh, do you guys want to explain personal endeavors? Okay, maybe just quickly and then think if you've got any questions about ways you could get advice from the group. Yeah. Kids should vote. <laughs> I want to be able to vote. <laughs> no, I'm just saying that I, when I listen to you, and I, you know, and I've been part of the democratic school in Israel too, where children really know how to speak their mind and heart, and I just think that you should run the world. We as adults should step down and just be your guests. I'm serious. It's just so beautiful. Okay, so have you, how far along have you gotten? How far, what are the possibilities of you really being able to pull this off? Uh, so right now, we are in the process of filling out the charter school application and around next year in April, I mean by that I mean like 2018 in April, we'll probably present to the board um, we'll probably present to the board and see if it will get approved. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So it so takes a long time. Especially and since we're students. Why not, to, why, why not even to next year? Um, so right now we still are working on process, processes on how to do things, and we have to make sure that we follow all the standards and laws that they have for DPS or Denver Public Schools and for Colorado State laws with the education, we um, we have to look over those, make sure we are applying them to our school, but still having them the way that we want them. When this thing opens, you think you'll still be in school? We might be like seniors in high school. Might be seniors, huh? Yeah, might be seniors in high school. Okay, and. Um, so, um, have you met with the board at all yet and stuff? No? Uh, is the local board, do you think, open to something like this? 
So I'm going to speak to that. I think they they really could accomplish this. Um, they have the support. A lot of people in the district know about what they're doing, and they definitely have a lot of people's interest. The challenge is going to be for them to demonstrate when they speak and when they present that they have something, because their challenge is going to be for the board to take them seriously. And that's part of why they're taking this time to prototype things and make sure they've thought through all of the different mm. pitfalls mm. and that they can really speak to them and that they can back up some of what they're doing with research. So it takes time. I think they could possibly submit this coming April, but the group is sort of setting their goal two years out because they see how long when they're meeting just once a week and there's so much learning that goes on. It yeah. takes time, and they, I've been impressed with their patience and tenacity as they work okay. through it. Have you met with Arnie Langberg? I have. You three have not. I think you yeah. need to meet with him because he actually started Jefferson County Open School. Yeah. Oh. And he started after that a school in Denver, which was nice. I visited that also. I visited the others. And then it got closed down. So it's important to understand from him what he went through and why. Yeah. He also was a pioneer. He actually started a public alternative school before that in New York uh, called the Village School, I think. Uh, it's part of the Great Neck Public School System, which is still going. Yeah. And it's one of the very first public alternative schools. Huh? I think they're here. Who? No. The village school? Arnie Lang. Oh, no, it's a different one. Oh. Different village school. This is Long Island. But, but you should definitely meet with Arnie. He's a great guy, and he can tell you all kinds of things. He can introduce you guys, for sure. And I think he would give you a lot of confidence uh, in what you're doing, because he's been there, done that. Yeah. So, uh, OK. That sounds good. Anyth anybody want to add anything to? Or do you guys have any questions for the group? For advice? How, what about other kids? Have you talked to other kids? Yeah, how many are there other kids in your group? Um, so we used to have another member. His name was Anand. He came with us last year. Um, but he transferred high schools for his senior year of high school and is taking like was taking like four AP classes so he couldn't meet with us and now he's going off to college. Um, but we are doing a pilot in of our like independent slash self-directed program thing in um, June. What does that mean, a pilot? Um, it's like, so it's a prototype of our um, uh, program. And so there's a three-day excursion for team building and stuff where they go to Wyoming for the first three days. It's the weekend before. And then... Um, for the Monday through Friday, it's the schedule and um, testing out our self-directed program, and then for the next week as well. Uh, if you hadn't said that, I was going to suggest that. It, it really makes a big difference. If, you can, if people can see it kind of in operation, then they can really visualize it. This way, and this is for anybody who's trying to start a school. What we did at Brooklyn Free School is we had... Um, a two-day prototype of what we thought it was going to be, and we went to this church. Churches are good places to try to start because they're not, uh, they're already approved to be schools because they usually have Sunday school. And so we never thought the school would be there, but we thought, okay, well, so we got the per permission <coughs> to have our two-day thing there, and it was on a Friday and a Saturday. So people really only had to miss one day of school to take their kids out of school. Uh, in fact, I think it might have been even a holiday, so they maybe didn't miss any. And we had 35 students uh, in that demonstration school. And meetings were brought up, or, and all this kind of stuff. You would think that these students had been involved with this for a long time. It just it was all very natural to them. And all of a sudden, everybody could imagine it, to the extent that we wound up actually opening at that church, even though we didn't think that was going to be where it was going to be. It just, it just kind of 
imprinted on everybody. And we were there for six years, I think, until we actually bought a building uh, for $1.7 million. We had raised enough money to do that and borrow it and so on. And that's where it is now. It's in a five-story building in a nice part of Brooklyn. So um, I think that this is an excellent thing to do. I, I would like to ask just a quick question and then let another group speak. But I, th I think one of the things that this group has struggled with is that they are a very small group. And they've been working now for a couple of years. And so um, for a little while, I was talking to them about, do you want to try to recruit more kids into your group? And the group has said, they think there would be so much learning for new students to come on that it makes more sense to do the pilot in order to get other kids interested than to try to bring them on in the planning at this phase. And I thought that was really wise. Like it made a lot of sense to me. Well, but I wanted to hear from your experience whether, whether, well, whether you have any other I thoughts on that. I haven't had much experience trying to help start a public mm -hmm. school. So, uh, I mean, people have done that. There was one of our school starters that started one in Florida and it didn't make it through the whole year, you know. Uh, the local board refused to pay. <laughs> huh? Yeah, now uh, usually charter schools are not beholden to the... Yeah, but it, it, usually Denver's a little different. That, that if, if it, it'll be hard to get approved, but if they get approved... Yeah. It's district, yeah. but that doesn't happen in... What would happen in Denver would be they would have a hard time getting approved or they would have a hard time getting enough students recruited. Those are two real problems that could happen. The, the, the district won't bail on them if they have a significant... If they get approved with the board, they won't get... Um, it, it, the, our district is a very pro-charter district, and I've never seen that happen where the district suddenly pulled just because they didn't. Now, well, what could see, happen is after a couple of years, if again, they start again, struggling just, with performance, yes, that could happen. Again, this but is, not mid-year. It would be too soon. This is why it's important to know your state laws, because in Florida, <coughs> it actually was up to the local board. In other places, it's a state-level thing. And so it really depends a lot. In this case, that local board just simply didn't pay. And so there was not much anyone could do about it. The staff didn't get paid. They had to close. Mm -hmm. Okay, who else wants to do one next? I just wanted to make a comment. Yeah. I'm not sure like what everything is involved in creating your charter school, but perhaps, I don't know if you've thought of this, but during the pilot, if you have somebody video documenting what is happening, a videographer. First of all, that can create more um, of a sense of how this is going when you present it. Second of all, I don't know if this would be ben beneficial, but perhaps somebody who's video documenting it um, can get it out there and say, look what these students, what these kids are doing. Like this is student created, right? This is amazing. It's very inspirational. Students who care so much about their education that they are going through all the steps that normally adults have to go through to create this and their doggedness and determination and persistence is an insp inspiring story. And perhaps, I don't know, if getting it out there through some news source or perhaps Upworthy, who knows, would uh, garner support for this in beneficial ways. Okay, so uh, anything you want to say in conclusion before we go on to, and I think we can do one more group? No? Okay. Uh, who else, who would like to go? Okay. Okay, so I want you to be as upfront as possible. I don't get, I won't get my feelings hurt because I, you have so much experience, so please say not that you, I think you're holding back. <laughs> um, <laughs> you are, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm in um, kind of this, you know, unusual position of uh, doing something that is, everyone is doing things that are very different here, but I'm doing what I think is, um, it's way too much for myself and my husband, and we're working on, uh, making that greater. We're building this neighborhood community development, and I see the community as our school, 
and because we unschool right now our kids <laughs> and then we uh, hope to have other families. We will have other families who are doing similar things. But you actually things. have started doing something. We have 144 acres, and we are working on getting things passed, We're dealing with the city. And this is say, where? This is in Corvallis, Oregon. Corvallis, yeah. So there used to be some alternative in Corvallis a long time ago. There's nothing there are there. alternatives in there Corvallis. Are. There's no Sudbury. I've talked with, I've considered Sudbury. Last year I started, a, there's one in Eugene. And there's one that worked with kind of between Eugene and Corvallis. Uh -huh. <coughs> so, and last year I started, a, you know, the first kind of attempt. I shouldn't say attempt. It was very successful for what my family needed, which was the goal. It's very similar to, I don't know your name over here, the Bethany, um, what she seems to be doing. And we worked, got together with other families, rented a location, and met, in our case, three times a week. Um, it was just such a huge burden for me. It was so financially, like, people don't want to, I found people didn't want to pay me to let their kids run around and play and vote on things themselves. I mean, really like-minded parents, I, I believe, that were like, we'll just get together with friends and do this at our house. I mean, these are unschoolers. They don't yeah. want to pay someone. So, so part of what you have to do is become uh, cognizant enough of this whole process so you can explain to them the things that happen in this kind of situation that wouldn't ordinarily happen uh, mm -hmm. just letting kids run around. The kind of interactions, uh, the kind of resources uh, that you'll have, uh, you know, the kind of school community and culture that you'll have uh, and, and how that would be hard to recreate, you know, in the other way. And just, if nothing else, the um, variety, which you can't necessarily get with just playing with a few friends, you see. Right. And I think part of my difficulty is that I've wanted to appeal to homeschoolers and schoolers. Yeah. And they don't want to, they are happy. That's a problem. They're pretty well, happy. Well, you know, I want to say something about that. <laughs> That's not a problem that they're happy. But yeah, they don't no, feel no, the but need I wanna, that I feel. Yeah, yeah. But I want to say something about that. If yeah. you're starting a new alternative, sometimes it's hard to make a school, and so you want to start a homeschool resource center. Right. But it's important to understand that if you start with existing homeschoolers, they are fickle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, you, they've been there, done that, and they and there's another idea the kids down the can road. be great, <laughs> but then they'll flake right off as soon as there's something else comes along. Yeah. Uh, whereas, if you tell people you're starting a new alternative, and then parents come to you, and they say, I want to put my kid in your school, and you say, well, we're not a school, you have to be homeschool, it will show you how to do it. Uh, we'll help you start with it. We'll train you okay. to do this. They will remain loyal to you. And this is the experience, for example, that um, uh, a very, very good homeschool resource center in Massachusetts um, had, what's it called? Um, North Star. Uh, oh, yes. With North They're Star. Here too, right? North, North Star. They're here in Portland as well now. If I'm correct, is that not? No, I don't think so, unless they, but they see, they do have programs where they have helped people start homeschool resource centers. That's it, and, some, and there's one. And here. so people are yeah. based on that, yes. Yeah. So they said that in the end, maybe only 15% of their kids, they have 80 kids now, I think, uh -huh. maybe 15% were previously homeschoolers. Yes. So that's an important thing to understand. Don't try to depend on a big homeschool group. Don't necessarily do your recruiting of the current homeschoolers. Fine if they ca get involved, they're terrific kids. Oh, yeah. Don't expect them to stick around. Or pay. They have other things to do. <laughs> yeah, okay, go ahead, and what else? Okay, and then just, I'd love it if you just, anything that, if you have something that comes to mind, any ideas along with this, as this greater thing um, you know, unfolds this, this whole community, I want, um, I want to be a student at this. I want, this is our learning world. We are, uh, yeah, I want a library. I want classrooms where someone could organize a class. But I want to feel, uh, you know, I'm kind of in a space where it's dream it up and we may, may do it. 
Yeah. So I'd love you any have thoughts this on that. Property. Right. And have you started any anything, any kind of program on it yet? It, no, cows are on it right now. Like that, we just have it under contract. Are they, are they free cows? <laughs> no, there are ve vegans in the neighborhood who do try to set them free. They're not my cows. Oh, They're okay, renting okay, the okay. land. <laughs> All right, well, you know. <laughs> my kids are very free on the land. Uh, we live yeah, around yeah, the yeah. corner yeah. and we still need oh, to build okay. a house. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, sometimes, sometimes it works to start a camp. Camp, okay. Sometimes it works to start a camp. If you keep in mind that this is not what you're just going to do. You, you, yeah. you, it's a stepping stone and you let people know f from the beginning. Uh, it's also remember the prototype thing is good to show people what it could be like. See, so people can really envision it. Better. Well, I guess what I'm asking is, I actually care even more you than starting... You can do something during school vacations, for example. Yeah. Program. And that's good for people, like, within the community as we build to... who may be coming from another perspective to say, hey, why don't we all hang around and learn right here. Right. We have b cottage businesses, all right, these different right. things, to right. agriculture, right. all inter you know, within it. Didn't you like that image of, 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 of a library just expanding to being all this other stuff that that's Peter it. talked that's about last thing. night? <laughs> that's it, that's our thing. That's it, and, and so uh, a resource center fits in really well within it, but right. I really see the school as the whole community and every age. Everybody's right. in it. It's even the expanded from the four to 18. My babies, you know, would be just as much a part of that community right. as and anyone it's else. It's also related to that concept you talked about a park. And the, I was explaining to Peter yeah. afterwards that there is somebody in Russia uh, whose father was a guy by the name of Balaban. And I met with him and he started something called park schooling. Park schooling being the same thing as just going into a park and doing whatever you wanted to. That was his concept of school. Yeah. And so what he, they did is they actually did a prototype of it within a public alternative school where there were a, a school of about 600 kids. They had 70 kids that were part of the park school program and had just the resources of the whole school to do whatever they wanted with. They could go to any class they wanted to or not. They could organize, they could have music. Yeah. And, and yeah. so, and, and his daughter is actually continuing to try to do this in different places in Russia, park schooling. Oh, in Russia. Okay. Yeah, in Russia, yeah. Doesn't it get cold? Put on your warm clothes, not people always. used to live in it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. so, so I see that, I love that idea of expanding it and even presenting it as like this, this is our school, the expanded uh, library. And this even makes me wonder if there would be, if part of our funding, because we're still, we have investors, but we definitely need more investment for all that we're doing to happen. <coughs> um, I love the idea of saying like, when we build a cottage industry in this community, it needs to be, it can be funded. Uh, as education. All of this is a part of education. Okay, let's try to do one more quickly. Who would like to have their one, theirs done very quickly at the end here? Anybody? Ready? No? Yes? You, you want? No, okay. Sure, go ahead. Um, I don't really, uh, I don't really know how to, um, we're in Los Angeles, and so Los Angeles is a really hard place to it's start. It's a wasteland. <laughs> it's an armpit. Educationally. <laughs> it's horrible. It's a wasteland educationally. Wha it's whenever really anyone hard. asks me what is in LA, I say Play Mountain Place, and I kind of am stuck after that. Because uh, that's been going right. for 50 years. It's a nice little alternative. But they, for example, spun off Pacifica, and then that got kind of crushed. Uh -huh. uh, so, but what do you have in mind to do there? Well, uh, uh, well, <laughs> what I want to do is I love that library idea. We, 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 we I, I really want um, a democratic school uh, somewhere on the spectrum. I want kids to be, you know, creating a lot of what happens at school and making important decisions. But the, I really want, uh, we really want, I think, um, to continue kind of what we started 30 years ago well, and it kind of it uh, kind of just got disintegrated by hmm. by well you have a base <laughs> you have a base right yes uh, is it 
operating in the same philosophy that you started with? Sort of. I sort which of. Is, which is what? The. The philosophy is the uh, Vygotsky and Piagetian based. Uh, Vygotsky. Child centered. So tell learning. People what, tell tell pe people what Vygotsky's idea was. F I V I G O T S K. V Y G O T. Oh, V Y. Yeah, it's V Y. Sorry. Vy got. I've met. i met. By the way, I've met Vygotsky's daughter and granddaughter. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Well, good for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so it, it, it's research based. We don't. Uh, I'm not wed to any one particular like one particular methodology, but that we learn everything we can learn about how people grow and learn and what's really good for them, and sprinkle it all over the place, set up the, the environment so that people can enter the environment and make choices that are, uh, will evoke all kinds of interesting things. So how um, many kids are in this program now? Well, right now I have 50, 50, 50 in, preschoolers, in pre three to six, or I, had, I just recently raised the, and so Raise you the say age. When you say you came back in what role? Well, I came back as executive director now. So you're executive director now. Correct. Okay. Again. Again. Well, I never was before. Before I was, um, I was just a, a co-founder. I was oh. a teacher. I okay. was, okay. and I, I served as director. So you're executive director. Okay. And your board is supportive of what you want to do. Right. Uh, uh, but they fell away from the mission and philosophy. They went more t to more standardized, traditional right. kinds of controlling okay. the children concepts, which is So they must be okay horrible. with you moving it back in that direction. They are. Yes. That's what they want. And they want to expand outward. But the... Uh, you know, it upward uh, to uh, different age levels so and stuff. So what's stopping you from just doing it? Money, I guess. I guess. Why? W well, you have to fundraise. Is it is is it public, public or private? It's private. It's private. What's the tuition there now? Oh, it's not very expensive. It's it's a it's a parent participation school, and it varies be depending on how many days a week you go. So I don't actually know. But if you went full time all the time. It would probably cost about twelve hundred a month. A, a year? A month. A month. Oh, twelve. Okay. Well, that's money. That's money. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, so what? If but you, not in Los Angeles. But if you go, if you go to the next, if, say, first grade. Say yeah. You're going to go to first grade next year. To age eight. Huh? We'll take kids as, as old well, as age eight. Well, but let's say you you want to do that all at once, or you want to do one grade at a time. Well, I I've learned that incremental stuff is good. Uh, you know, building so, incrementally, so, so ma making so a stable if, if base, you, and then growing upward. If you announced that you were going to go to first grade next year, and people came in, and you still had your same tuition schedule, why, why would that be a problem? Well, we we need space. Or we need would more need, space. yeah. It's we are in a little craftsman bungalow. It's oh. very charming. It's very homelike. You have and land? It's, it's it's not very much. No, we that's we need space. That's so basically, is it, so space is the issue. Build on that land, or do you need an entirely different location? I need a different location. Ah, so that's your main stumbling block. Correct. Where to have it in right. L.A. In Los Angeles, it's very very expensive. Ah. And um, okay, uh, have you got people looking into locations? Yes, yes, and we've had. Um, We've had people, uh, for about a year, we've had this uh, group of uh, interested people that are, it's uh -huh. some teachers and some parents who would like to create, and we worked on core philosophy and what would be the mission and how, what kind of school would we create. Um, that was a slightly different group of people. Well, what's that? Right. Now your turn. Uh, I was drawing circles here because we actually have been trying in three different places. One was to expand this current school where there's a base of up-and-comers. Right. But before that, we were working with this group we called ourselves the New School Group, and they were more elementary age, uh. and their, a lot of their interest was middle school. Middle school. And, um, and then there was a third group who tried to d start a Reggio-inspired elementary school, but and so we've been working with them. <laughs> so, so there's an interest in all this direction. Okay, well, I think you've got to make sure not to kind of take on too much all at once. But just to get back to this idea of going just to, say, first grade, even this coming year, uh, first of all, legally, can you do it, or you're not a school? and then just No, you, uh, after age five, we could do it like 
uh, I have a license. I expanded our license. The licensing will permit uh, three-year-olds all the way up to whatever age they are when they enter first grade. That's kind of the license. It's kind of mm -hmm. Yeah. But after age six, okay. But you're right now it's you to have you right have a right school. Right now is to what age? To six. And so that's what you can do now. Right, but you can't mix. They won't allow you to mix programs. It's for children's safety. The, uh, the state will not allow you to mix three-year-olds with seven-year-olds. Okay, have you thought about, have you thought about, see maybe, you have to be careful not to think, oh well we just can't do this till we get a whole other location. Okay. What about if you contacted some local churches and decided to just continue to, to begin with, to have your program for the next older group there, and if that meets those standards for that age. Um, and then, um, you know, yeah, it may be a little messy at first, but then you start building up the finances, you see. Both the schools we were involved in uh, started in churches and then yeah, expanded okay. out. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. so you, you could do that. And yeah. in fact, I mean, if the other parents were ambitious enough, they could even try to do the same thing for their, what they want to do for their groups and start small like that. And in different locations, all kind of nearby each other, you can get together and do stuff together some, and stuff like that. But it's a little messy at first, but at least you kind of established it and then you see you're building up some finances, you're getting more people involved, and then you see you can really demonstrate the need to get a, a, a new site. Yeah. <laughs> so that might yeah. be a way, rather than saying you have to do it all at once and then never getting it done. Right, that's kind of, yeah, we're sort of So frozen. that would be a way of doing it. And this it happens. Sometimes, you know, when something is starting new like that, uh, you're all over the place. I remember that, <laughs> At one point, the fire marshal said we couldn't use the building we were in anymore. Uh -huh. And so <laughs> what did we do? We wrote a thing saying we're now a school without walls and we will meet in places that meet the standards. <laughs> and we literally went for six months not necessarily knowing where school was going to be the next day. <laughs> in fact, we, made a, a, we actually made a little documentary reenactment of a, a true story about a kid who went to 12 buildings before he could find the school. <laughs> and, and what's interesting is he wanted to find the school, you see, yeah, which tells you good, something, yeah. you know. And, so, and, and on time, days when we just didn't have a place to go, we'd go to the university's library. <laughs> okay. So, you know, uh, yeah, so, so, you know, sometimes it has to be me messy like that a little bit. Um, okay, I okay. think that we've kind of run out of time. You have something you want to say? children because if you don't have the children there's nothing to do with the building right so you have the children and I would encourage you to do that it reminds me of story that when I just came back from Boulder to Israel one of the pr first project that the Department of Education the the Democratic Education Institute had given me is to go up in the north of Israel and help a community a small community it was a prior kibbutz that became a cooperative to build a school and I met them in uh, like a tractor shack, literally where they, where they put all the tractors. And I said, where are we going to have it? And he said, well, somebody donated a yurt, and we have enough funding for another yurt. Would you help us open the school? So we opened the year with two yurts. Now they have five, and they're huge success with a wait list. Uh, and they're in, in the forest. Yeah, and one of the schools, yeah. one of the schools that we helped to start in England uh, started with a yurt, a yurt <laughs> yeah. too. Yeah, writing down. But, but, by the way, I helped, I, helped, I helped build the first yurt in the United States. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, was, I, I, was, I, I knew a guy by the name of Bill Carperthwaite, uh -huh. who I'd heard was doing a subsistence farming school and I hitchhiked, I was in college, I hitchhiked up to Maine and, and asked where he was and they said, oh, you have a long way to go. <laughs> and they said, you see the, 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 the trail across the way, there's no road there, you have to hike across the peninsula. And I was with a suitcase and a, <laughs> with a tie. suit jacket, you know. <laughs> and so I went in there and was spent, spent, I found him eventually. <laughs> It was getting dark, uh, <laughs> and and I wound up staying with them. And then at one point, he asked us to go out and gather these these uh, you know sort of uh, 
small trees mm -hmm. and put them together and we were going to do this idea that he had taken that he'd found in Mongolia mm -hmm. to build uh, a yurt uh -huh. and so we helped build that first yurt Beautiful. and in fact I saw him 25 years later he was building a yurt for in Ithaca for mm -hmm. the for for Dave Lehman's school so yeah. anyway thank you okay you all right show. thank you everybody for coming i'm happy to work with anybody who didn't get a chance to talk enough about this and we can just you can just come and grab me and and thanks for coming